We just got the Jeffrey Epstein of the music and entertainment industry. The new lawsuit that just dropped against Diddy is massive and it has photos, it has videos, it names names. And there's so much here that it's never gonna fit into a single video. So I'm gonna do a quick overview in this video and then I'm gonna do a couple of parts breaking down all the different aspects of what's come out so far. We're talking crime scenes. We're talking photo evidence of celebrities like Cuba Gooding Jr. We're talking record label executives. We're talking hidden cameras in every room of the house getting recordings of celebrities, executives, politicians, at parties with celebrities and underage girls, with drinks being spiked, with drugs. This goes all the way back to the murder of Tupac and Biggie. We're talking about the entire rap and hip hop industry and the whole music industry at large. But to be clear, this is just opinions and speculation. These are not statements of fact. When I show sources in the background, like the court case, you should take those for just what they are. I'm not saying that all of this is necessarily real. So what's happened just now is that this man, Rodney Jones, who is a music producer that worked with Sean Combs, who is Diddy, he just filed this lawsuit. And he didn't just file it against Diddy, he filed against the executives at all of the companies associated and against the companies like Universal Music Group. His lawyers claim that he has secured hundreds of hours of footage and audio recordings of Diddy and his staff and his guests engaging in serious illegal activity. It's illegal for lawyers to make these claims if they don't have reasonable belief that this evidence is legitimate and exists. They could get disbarred for making these claims if they're not true. And some of that evidence is present in this lawsuit, like when Diddy allegedly shot a man. And then the LAPD saw that room in the photo, the bathroom with all that blood, and were on the scene for hours and no arrests were made. They went with the explanation that Diddy told his staff to give, which was it was a drive-by shooting. Diddy made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. This guy. And all of Diddy's staff were instructed to contact Mr. Muhammad if they were ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. Diddy often bragged about having law enforcement under control. Although the deeper you look, the more it looks like people above him and above law enforcement had him under control. We'll go more into these cases in the detailed videos, but now the bigger picture. See, Diddy has been one of the most powerful people in the rap industry ever since the 90s when he founded Bad Boy Records. And he was only 24 when he founded it. He started his career as a non-paid intern at a and until he was then fired in 1993 when he was 24 and founded his own label, Bad Boy Records, later that year. So how does a 24-year-old found a massive record label on his own. Well, when you dig further, you realize it wasn't on his own. It was with the help of Clive Davis, his mentor. And the further into it all you dig, you realize that Clive Davis came out as gay later on, and there's a lot of rumors that him and Diddy were in a relationship throughout this time. This is gonna come up over and over and over, just by chance. Clive Davis has been running significant portions of the music industry since our parents were kids listening to music. Responsible for artists like Aretha Franklin, Alicia Keys, The Grateful Dead, then later Usher, Outkast, Pink. But back in the 60s and 70s, like Janis Joplin, Santana, Aerosmith, Pink Floyd, like, come on, read it. Jones specifically claims that they were trying to groom him to do gay stuff, which has long been the talk of the town in the rap industry by people that aren't with it. Diddy allegedly showed him a tape from a secret recording that he just happened to have of, of Jones's idol having gay sex with some white guy. And then Diddy apparently told Jones that he had engaged in gay sex with this redacted rapper and that redacted rapper and his idol, Stevie J. And apparently he also promised to make sure that Jones would win producer of the year at the Grammys if he did gay stuff on camera. Although, to be clear, he wasn't explicitly saying on camera, but... Mr. Jones discovered that Diddy had hidden cameras in every room of his home. I'm gonna guess that Diddy didn't learn how to wire a whole house with cameras on his own. Kanye has accused Diddy of being a fed many times. Diddy's also been accused of ordering the hit on Tupac many times. And when Diddy was asked about this on a podcast, this was his response. So we, don't, we don't talk about things that are nonsense. We don't even entertain nonsense, my brother. So we're not even gonna even go there with all due respect, but... I appreciate you as a journalist asking. When you start digging into allegations of the CIA, the FBI, the Mossad having tentacles in the music industry, you wind up at total rumors like this. Former CIA agent admits agency created gangster rap to fill private prisons by glamorizing criminality. 
claims like famous hip hop lyrics of the legendary hip hop outfit NWA were even scripted by a team of psychologists and war propagandists inside the CIA, according to this former agent. Obviously, these are just totally rumors and conspiracy theories, no truth to this whatsoever. But it leads you to people like Lior Cohen, who might be the most influential person in the last hundred years of music, because he ran Def Jam and made Jay-Z who he is, including Med Red Man, Method Man, DMX, Ja Rule, Ludacris. But it doesn't stop with rap music. We got Bon Jovi, Mariah Carey, Shania Twain, Elvis Costello, Ashanti, Nickelback, Slipknot, Sum 41, The Killers, Slayer. But then we've also got his protege, Julie Greenwald, that got elevated through this merger that he brokered and managed the Black Keys, Bruno Mars, Death Cab for Cutie, Jason Rantz, Kid Rock, Lupe Fiasco, Wiz Khalifa. That would be this Julie Greenwald. And then we've got Lucian Grange, the CEO of Universal Music Group. He's the one that is directly implicated and named in this lawsuit. It is alleged that he attended these parties with underage girls and with sex workers, and he knew that they were spiking drinks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when you're talking about Diddy, you got to also talk about Justin Bieber, um, who was managed by Scooter Braun, along with Kanye West, Ariana Grande, Demi Lovato, etc. Um, Scooter Braun is a really big player in the modern music industry. We also got Psy, Carly Rae Morris, uh, Martin Garrix, Kanye West, Black Eyed Peas, David Guetta, Lil Dicky. So you might not remember, but back in the 90s, um, Tupac and Biggie were both coming up and they were both talking about leaving their records that we've shown the people involved in those records already and starting their own. And Tupac was starting to speak out a little bit maybe about the state, the nature of the industry. Diddy was close in the middle of that and there's a lot of rumors that he ordered the hit on Tupac. Diddy sort of rose to power on the power vacuum of Tupac and Biggie both leaving the scene. And he has been manipulating and running a huge portion of the industry from the inside ever since. And this court case directly alleges with lots of evidence that he has been running a sexual blackmail scheme that entire time. Promoting artists that would engage in the sexual blackmail scheme and then do their bidding there because there's not just him acting alone and pushing out, ostracizing, blacklisting, attacking artists that wouldn't. So uh, maybe you should go back and listen to some of Kanye's interviews and see if he sounds quite so crazy after all. In order to understand this lawsuit against P. Diddy, you need to understand the history of sexual blackmail. A lot of people in the comments are misunderstanding why rap music is so anti-gay. And a lot of people understand the ties of Israel and the Mossad to sexual blackmail by Epstein, but a lot of people don't realize the ties of sexual blackmail back to the invention of sexual blackmail and the Jewish mob. So if you don't know what's going on, Diddy, one of the most influential people in the rap industry over the last 30 years, just got served this court case that alleged all kinds of crimes, including murder and drugs and prostitution, but especially having all of his homes wired with cameras and hosting parties with underage girls, rappers, label executives, celebrities, politicians, and collecting sexual blackmail on tons of important people. Like we're talking Jeffrey Epstein level of operation, but in the music and entertainment industries. But the thing about a court case is that we're only getting the allegations that are in that case and they're only relevant to what that defendant saw and experienced. And so the bigger picture is not filled in directly. You have to kind of understand the history of this stuff and what each thing might imply about the bigger picture. And that requires an understanding of the history of this stuff. And it's not complicated and it's a wild story. <laughs> so. The FBI was founded by J. Edgar Hoover. He actually was the head of the Bureau of Investigation, the BOI, before the FBI was even invented back in the 20s. And he served there for 11 years. Then they invented the FBI and he served as the head of the FBI for 37 years, totaling 48 years leading what was more or less the FBI. So we're talking like all the way from like the Great Depression through World War II into like the 60s like through the 60s music revolution into the 70s. All of that time period, the FBI was led by the same person and he was one of the most corrupt government officials in all of US history. And understanding the state of organized crime and of law enforcement in America is impossible if you don't know about J. Edgar Hoover. And understanding the nature of sexual blackmail is impossible if you don't know about Meyer Lansky, who was a boss in the Jewish mob back in the 30s, 20s, like, you know, like the Prohibition days and so on. 
Meyer Lansky, this Jewish mob boss, basically invented the concept of sexual blackmail. And he did it by sexually blackmailing J. Edgar Hoover, the guy who was explicitly supposed to be taking guys like Meyer Lansky down. The Wikipedia articles are sanitized, but basically Meyer Lansky had a photo of J. Edgar Hoover using his mouth on his main assistant, Clyde Tolson. Realistically, it was his boyfriend. They were a, a couple. But then, once Hoover was blackmailed, he was like, fuck it, how much worse could it get? And so he started hosting blackmail parties in connect collusion with these mobsters and inviting all sorts of important people to these blackmail parties to collect his own blackmail. This all happened in what was called the Blue Suite at the Plaza Hotel. And it was basically a bunch of male cross-dressing orgies all caught on camera for like a decade or more. And because Hoover was already blackmailed by the most powerful gangsters in the world, like he didn't give a shit and he just went and hosted them and everybody got blackmail on everybody. But the critical piece to understanding the gay aspect of rap music today and the whole situation back with Hoover is that at the time, remember Cold War, McCarthyism, like we got to get rid of all the communists there was what was called the Lavender Scare, which is basically just saying that they were all really worried that gay people would get blackmailed by the Soviet Union. And so it wasn't good to be gay because if you were gay, you could get blackmailed because you wouldn't want anyone to know you were gay. And so don't be gay. And so you should be ashamed of being gay. And so then the blackmail is like, you know, see, it's like a big circle of how the one creates the other, creates the other, creates the other. Yeah, now think about rap music. All the rappers are super hard and like gay people suck. And then like a bunch of them are gay and they're getting blackmailed about it. And so they rap more about how they're hard and gay people suck and it creates this little circle. Yeah, the sexual blackmail industry learned early on back in the Cold War that it is much easier to do sexual blackmail in a culture of anti-gayness because gayness is not wildly uncommon. Lots of people are gay. But the more you can stigmatize it and make it a taboo, the more they have to hide it and the more easy it is to exploit it when you offer this taboo thing to the people that want it. And then the stronger your power over them is when you have them on film doing it, you feel? So back to our boy Diddy, who founded his record label when he was only 24 years old, became one of the most successful record labels of the time. He was able to do that because he was financed and supported by his mentor. Clive Davis, who just happens to be gay and rich and Jewish, just like Meyer Lansky was. And at the time, he was one of the most influential men in the music industry. He'd managed all kinds of the biggest name artists that you've ever heard of. And he found this guy, Diddy, on the up and up in one of his companies, who we now know from this lawsuit and the other lawsuit filed by his ex-girlfriend, Cassie, which is horrific, disgusting, not a good read. We know that Diddy has some real effed up sexual proclivities, as well as just generally probably being at least gay or bi, one of the two. So Clive Davis finds this guy with questionable morals, questionable sexual habits, and ready to go fucking crazy haywall, hay, haywall, whatever. Like he's willing to shoot people. He's willing to launder money. He's willing to do crazy drugs. He's willing to do basically anything. This is just me speculating on Clive here on his motivations, but Clive mentored Diddy and Clive brought him up and Clive elevated him to a record executive by helping him found his label, Bad Boy Records. That was Clive's move. He did that. And then Diddy, along with a lot of help from a lot of other people all around him, proceeded to do 30 years worth of sexual blackmail operations within the rap industry and promoted artists that seem to have been ensnared in it, like Usher, for example, like Meek Mills. Hell, even Justin Bieber is like directly in this storyline. And so what you wind up with is a rap industry, a music industry that is full of people that are creating the types of music that the people above them, that the people that hire them, that the people that manage them want them to make they're all terrified of stepping on the wrong toes or getting out of line or doing what they're not supposed to for one blackmail reason or the other. And we wind up with an entire industry full of musicians that are glorifying gangs and violence and sex and drugs. I mean, think about it. There's no better way to undermine an entire population, an entire race, an entire culture than to target their kids with subversive messages that they're gonna think is cool and the parents can't say shit about it because then the kids will just think it's cooler. So why would they be doing this, you ask? That's a really good question. Gonna have to wait for another video for that one. 
Did you know that the head of Diddy's security, while he was sexually blackmailing the entire rap industry, was also the exact same guy that was the head of Michael Jackson's security when he died? This is no joke. Some smart people in the comments section pointed this out to me. This is from Diddy's lawsuit. This is his head of security, Fahim Muhammad. And Mr. Combs, P. Diddy, made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. Diddy instructed his staff to always contact Mr. Muhammad if they were ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. The LAPD was at this crime scene where Diddy had shot a person for hours and no arrests ever happened. It all went away. And it says here, quote, this was all thanks to Mr. Muhammad's connections with law enforcement. These are just allegations made in the case, but they say they have substantial evidence and they provide some of that evidence in photo form in this lawsuit. In addition, because he was the head of Diddy's security, he would have been privy to the fact that there were sex workers and underage girls at all of these parties and that they were spiking bottles of liquor and champagne and mixed drinks with various drugs. Rodney Jones, who's bringing this whole court case, alleges that after he was forced to drink the laced liquor, he felt lightheaded and then recalls passing out and waking up at 4 a.m. the following morning naked with a sex worker sleeping next to him. There's another time where he passed out and Diddy was in the bed too. All that just to say that the head of security is aware of these things. That's their job. He would also be aware of all the different drugs that they're doing and lacing with things. Apparently, all of the employees that were around Diddy were from the butler to the chef to the housekeepers were all required to walk around with a pouch or fanny pack filled with all these different drugs so that Diddy had immediate access to whatever drugs he wanted everywhere he went. That's directly in the lawsuit. The head of security knows about that stuff. But then when you start looking up Fahim Muhammad, you quickly realize that yes, he was the head of security for Michael Jackson. This is a picture from him testifying in court about Michael Jackson's death. And when you listen to that testimony, you discover that he was the second person on the scene. He says that when he entered the room, the doctor was there apparently trying to give CPR to what looked like a dead Michael Jackson. And then Jackson's two kids arrived in the door and were sobbing and crying. But when you look deeper, it gets even weirder. This is his bio from his investment management company called Oasis. It's a real estate investment company where it says that he founded Elite Transportation and Security Services, and then he grew that company into a multi-million dollar business, which currently has several exclusive security contracts with A-list clients like Diddy. But when you look up Elite Transportation and Security Services, LLC, you get a really different picture. It was founded in 2016, apparently has five official employees, and is estimated to make $248,000 a year in revenue. Multi-million dollar business? Multiple exclusive contracts? Then in 2019, he co-founded Oasis, where this bio is from, which is his real estate investment company, and they turned a $40,000 investment into a $10 million real estate portfolio. Uh, in how many years? And then the last article that comes up, there's a lot of articles about this one, is that he made news when he gave his 13-year-old son 40 acres of land for his birthday. And that 40 acres of land just so happens to be directly on the U.S.-Mexico border in San Diego County. This reporter for CBS 8 said they went and visited him there and there were boulders, trees, and the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Maybe just a weird coincidence? But by the way, he has way more than just the acres he gave to his son. He has like 191 acres on that plot or something like that. And he gave a portion of it to his son. And it just so happens to be within stone's throw distance of Tijuana. And now the two last ones are the best ones. I shit you not, I was looking up Fahim and where did I find another article about him? On Penn State, the Wharton School. He didn't attend it as a student. He was invited as a speaker um, for this Wharton real estate entrepreneurship event, which makes perfect sense. He has a real estate investment company or whatever, but if you've been following along, you would know that the Wharton school comes up an awful lot when we're talking about intelligence agencies and people associated with the CIA and the FBI, etc. Just thought it was interesting that they invited him to be a, perf a honored speaker at their event. And now here's the best part. Check this out. 
In, this is in all of his bios, by the way, but we're pointing it out now. In 2008, Fahim graduated from Sacramento State University with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration with a concentration in Real Estate and Marketing. Okay? Do you realize what's wrong with that yet? Anything coming to mind? When did Michael Jackson die? June 25th, 2009. Jackson died from cardiac arrest caused by a propofol and benzodiazepine overdose caused by his doctor, apparently. Um, hold up. Hold the phone. Pause. Why is a dude who just graduated college last year with a business and real estate degree the head of security for the king of pop, for Michael Jackson, the most famous musician of all time? What's going on? Don't you think that's a little weird? Not to mention what we know about his actual skill set now, given this lawsuit. I'm sure he didn't learn that in real estate business school. So anyways, just one little side tangent on this whole crazy story about Diddy. If you haven't been following along, we're discovering that Diddy is like the Jeffrey Epstein of the rap industry, and he's been doing secret filming of sexual blackmail activities at crazy parties where he's drugging his guests and bringing in underage girls. He's been doing that for like 30 years in the whole rap industry. I'm cooking on some bigger picture stuff, but I just thought that this tangent was crazy once I put the Michael Jackson connection together. If anyone has any more details about Fahim, please let me know. And if Fahim, if you want to come and hang out, um, I'd rather not. Please don't. I don't want to be friends, okay? I'm very happy up here in my cabin in Maine. I don't need anyone to come visit me in Maine. Um, I'm happy, no intention to go on long walks down the beach into the pond, nothing like that. Just saying. Michael Jackson conspiracy theories are back on the table. P. Diddy's sexual blackmail ring puts Michael Jackson's whole life story in a whole new light. So this new lawsuit just came out that shows tons of evidence that P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, has been running a sexual blackmail operation very much like Jeffrey Epstein, but in the rap and music industry for basically 30 years. And in that lawsuit, we learned that his head of security while he's running the sexual blackmail ring is this guy named Fahim Muhammad, who before working for Diddy was the head of security for Michael Jackson when he was only 21. And he was one of the first people on the scene when Michael Jackson died. And before we go to Michael Jackson, the most important part of the Diddy case to bring across is the fact that the record executives at the very top knew what P. Diddy was doing. They were attending the parties with underage girls where they were spiking drinks. They were deeply involved in Diddy's personal life and all evidence points to them supporting his operation or at the very least turning a blind eye to it. So let's revisit Michael Jackson, the king of pop, knowing what we know today. Starting in 1993, Michael Jackson was repeatedly accused of inappropriate things with children. And most of us eventually took that story and we're like, okay, that's messed up. Michael Jackson's a bad dude. Without necessarily taking into account the way that the press had been smearing him in really messed up ways for years. And then a bunch of documentaries were made before and after his death, smearing him left, right, and center. But the Diddy lawsuit directly points out and reminds us that the people that own the record companies also own the media publishing businesses that can print the tabloids. They have close relationships with the people that own the newspapers and the magazines that print these stories, that make these movies. That's how they offer record contracts to people and then get them to the top of the charts right away. That is, if they play ball, if you know what I mean. But when you actually look into the evidence, the FBI were investigating Jackson for 10 full years and they presented no evidence of criminal conduct on Jackson's part. The files have been declassified and you can view them yourself. They include a raid of his home where they confiscated all electronics. This is their ID number that you'll see. We're talking computers, hard drives, cell phones, where they say the amount of gigabytes. And then following are pages like this where they have the ID of the different devices and they all say nothing. Literally, they all say this. They found nothing. But that didn't stop the press from running made up stories about how secret FBI files revealed that Jackson had paid millions in hush money to dozens of boys he had abused, despite the FBI files directly negating that statement. And to be clear, Jackson was a weird dude. He grew up in one of the most effed up environments imaginable. 
He had basically no father figure and was kept from his mother. And the press has repeatedly tried to make him seem even weirder to us. But sometimes they publish articles trying to make him seem like wacko jacko, which is super racist. We'll get into that another time. But they actually wind up just showing his humanity, like how he's shocked by the real world because he doesn't understand it. In this article, they explain how when he first saw a homeless person, he was like, what's that? And his driver had to explain to him what a homeless person was. And he was like, holy shit. And he made them stop the car and he watched for a while, then gave the woman $300. And then when they saw that a man that she was with was about to try to take it from her, Jack Jackson went and gave him $300. And she was crying and said that he'd saved her. And then he spent the rest of that day driving around, giving out $100 bills to homeless people, saying how it's just amazing that the world could be so messed up. He sang about this kind of stuff all the time. In that same article, they also confirmed that he likes women, not underage ones, and he had a secret girlfriend that he was seeing on the side but keeping it away from his kids and would always be back before they woke up. So they branded him as Wacko Jacko early on and just like totally annihilated his public image. But what you might not have known is that that is a direct reference to a monkey, a fighting monkey from an old like, who was like a cartoon character basically. His name was Jacko Macaco. And for the longest time, you could actually buy Jacko monkey dolls. And we could talk about how all the boys that accused him of things actually were in the middle of launching really successful entertainment industry careers when they made those allegations about what had allegedly happened to them when they were tiny children, despite having previously gone on their stand and under oath saying that nothing had ever happened. But that would just be a waste of time. One of the far more interesting and relevant claims is that Michael Jackson said a lot of things about Jewish people, particularly later in his career. And then he was smeared to all hell and back as an anti-Semitic Nazi. Except that when you search YouTube for the actual original phone call recording where he called Jews leeches, uh, YouTube won't let you see it. You can't find it. Instead, they feed you a bunch of videos that are of this other phone call that seems to be his doctor that allegedly killed him, calling him when he was in the middle, midst of heavy sedation and getting him to talk on the phone in slurred speech about how shitty his life was while he was completely fucked up on drugs. That his doctor that was talking to him probably knew he was high on, like, I don't know, just feels like a, a smear job to me. But when you search it on Twitter, you can find those videos no problem. Just saying. And that's not because X supports anti-Semitic content. That's because X allows you to get to primary sources. Because if you want to know how history happened, you need to be able to access the primary sources. And yes, Jackson did say that the Jews are probably referring to the Jews in the music industry are like leeches and that they took everything from them and that they did it on purpose. But when you look into those allegations or those insults, you realize that because of his will that was probably fake and filed right before his death. So the will was signed on July 7th in Los Angeles by three witnesses. But Jackson's family pointed out that he was in New York that day and there's video proving it. So they changed their story, but the witnesses definitely saw it and it was just in New York. So anyways, because of this will, John Bronca was put in charge of his estate, which included his net worth of 230 million, but far more importantly, his 50% share of Sony ATV worth 750 million. Yes, he was taking on Sony. He was going after the hand that feeds him. And when you look into John Bronca, in 2003, Jackson fired Bronca because he was siphoning money out of Jackson's accounts in collusion with Sony Music CEO, Tommy Mottola, and funneling it through a bunch of offshore accounts in the Caribbean. John Bronca is Jewish, and Tommy Mottola is also Jewish. Plus, Tommy Mottola married Mariah Carey partway through his life when she was a young, young woman, and he was an old man. And there are other allegations about that whole situation you can look up on your own. In the first video I made about the Diddy case where I broke down the whole thing, I went through a whole bunch of music executives that are involved in that case or that come about when you start looking into it. And every single person that I showed in that video that was not black was Jewish. Because whether you like it or not, whether you wanna call people names about it or not, the vast majority of the power in the music industry is controlled by Jewish men. Another good example who we have not talked about yet is Lou Pearlman, who is famous for the boy bands NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. Not trying to say that all Jewish people are bad. People are just people. They make their own choices. But in the music industry, there are a fuckload of Jewish men that are doing shitty things to people. And in a few other industries, too, when you think about it. We'll make another video about that. For most of Jackson's career, his head of security was Bill Bray, who was his mentor and basically his father. 
and the two were extremely close. Bill ran his security until he was 70 when he retired, and Jackson continued to pay his medical bills until he died at age 80. This is a letter that Michael Jackson wrote to Bill that is both really touching and really enlightens you as to the state of Michael Jackson's education and his perspective on the world and his life story. Pause if you want to read that. But then once Bill retired, Jackson was then protected by other security people that came and went. And he wound up with this guy who has direct connections to Diddy's sexual blackmail operations, who was directly complicit in covering up crimes for Diddy and covering up murders, covering up drug use, prostitution, human trafficking. This is the guy that was protecting Michael Jackson the day that he died. The day that he was overdosed on drugs after he was probably already asleep and the only witnesses, there, there were no witnesses to the crime. I'm honestly kind of surprised that this guy never got checked into as a suspect. I'm not trying to make any allegations, I'm just saying. Anyone can inject a dude with lots of propofol. So, knowing what you know now about the entertainment industry, about the world, about how this all works, about Israel, I suggest you re-examine the story of Michael Jackson and you re-listen to some of his lyrics. I bet if I include the song, they'll take the video down for copyright as a way to silence this video, but you should probably re-listen to the lyrics for They Don't Really Care About Us. And if you find the censored version, you should probably find out what the words that they censored are. And you know, looking into this whole story of Michael Jackson, the one thing that I couldn't stop thinking about is, man, that sounds a lot like Kanye West. But that's probably just a coincidence, right?